Portal is one of the most influential franchises that Valve has ever made. When Valve announced Portal on July 18th, 2006, with its ever iconic teaser trailer, many people were caught by surprise. It was posited to be part of the legendary Orange Box, and Portal was a little bonus game that would sit alongside hyped giants like Team Fortress 2 and Half-Life 2 Episode 2. Portal's mechanic was simple on paper, yet absolutely mind-boggling in execution. You had what was known as the portal device, and the premise is simple. You can shoot the device to place connected portals on surfaces, and use its ability to solve puzzles. And of course, you probably know the story from there. Anyone who has an even basic interest in video games would have heard the phrase, the cake is a lie, or some crazy ramble about incendiary lemons. If you're here for the story of Portal itself, you're in the wrong place. We're not talking about the main Portal series today. We kind of are, but not in the way you might typically know about. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever heard of Portal the Flash version? In the Portal community, the Flash version refers to two things, technically. First, a 2D fan game based in Flash that remade Portal's mechanics and came out the day prior to Portal's actual release. The second is a 3D reimagining of the Flash version, done in the actual Portal game as a mod. It aims to recreate everything seen in the original and add its own new segments to create a fresh new experience, even for those who played the original 2D game. These two versions of the game would be insanely popular in their own right. Whatever method you played it in, it was almost certainly part of your childhood if you are a Portal fan. Whether you remember the original Flash version for its easy to access nature, or the map pack for its ever memorable final confrontation, is a piece of Portal fandom history. But have you ever stopped to think, just what was the origin of these fan projects? Well, the original Flash game and the map pack were both created by a team named We Create Stuff. And looking around the internet, you're not going to find much remaining information about the origins of the Flash version projects. Just who were the people behind We Create Stuff when the Flash version was made? What was their story? Did they even think about a silly little Portal fan game they made over 17 years ago? Well, here's the good news. I'm here to bring you on a journey spanning five years about how the development, release, and legacy of a Portal fan game would forever change the course of not just fandom history, but Valve history as a whole. When I started research for this video, it was originally only covering one aspect of this history, something near the end of it, but in my pursuit of getting accurate information, I fell into an internet archaeology rabbit hole. The project began to balloon outwards from its original goal. I couldn't just talk about one aspect of this game's history. I needed to talk about all of it. I needed to make a documentary about this fan game's entire history. And eventually, I hit the bottom. I literally ran out of information to dig up as chasing dead links to the Wayback Machine would only take me so far down this pit. I had to turn to a different method. I needed to know where these came from. To outright state the surprise, this video project would have been impossible to make if not for the assistance of the very developers responsible for this fan game. The people behind Port of the Flash version we create stuff. Let's not don do any further, my friend. Take my hand and let's travel back in time to 2006, where the forgotten story of Portal's most iconic fan game began. I thank you for your time, and I hope you stick around to the end of the story. So, picture this. 
You are an avid fan of video games in mid-2006, and you just watched the Portal trailer for the first time, and your mind has been blown. You want to play this thing really badly, because it looks so cool. This exact attitude will be found all over the internet. People just really wanted to get their hands on Portal and experience it. And it was produced by Valve of all companies, so you knew it would be worth the wait. But how do you tide over that wait for the next few months? Of course, those knowledgeable on the Source Engine immediately got to work over that time. You could find janky Portal Gun mods created for Gary's Mod 9 and 10. There was even a Source Engine project named Excite that spawned its own modding scene. But these all had one thing in common. These mods only remade the gun. And Portal wasn't just about the Portal Gun. You really, really wanted to experience the game. And this would be a sentiment shared by two introverted teenagers who just saw the Portal trailer for the first time, excitedly tapping away at the keyboards on MSN Messenger. Meet Hen and Ido, at the time, at least 16 and 14 respectively. These two impatient Valve fans have been practically mind blown by Portal's trailer. They were Half-Life fans through and through, and they even experimented with mods. But Portal was truly something special to the duo when they laid their eyes on it. Now, Hen and Ido had been eager to make a game together in Flash, something that they could submit to Newgrounds. While the two had created short animations and small scale game projects in Flash, they never truly sat down to develop something big. The duo were a team they called We Create Stuff, part of the tendency to name things quite literally, and their desire to get the chance to experience Portal early had collided with their interest to create a game together. And thus, as the two immediately started to prototype the game, and Ido would begin making a game design document for the project, his first of many, Portal the Flash version was born. The two teams of Recreate Stuff got to work. Ido primarily would handle the programming side of things in the Flash, while Hen would handle translating Portal's visuals in the Flash. An orthographic look to the game was decided by the duo, as it allowed portals to more visibly appear on surfaces than if they were fully 2D. Of course, behind the scenes, it would still be a two-dimensional game. Ido would begin work on creating a physics engine and developing the portals themselves, referencing pieces of code for a platformer and action script 2.0 for the base movement. Portals would first come into existence via a drag and drop system for debugging purposes, letting Ido refine the player physics to a T before he learns how to calculate ray casting in order to have the player actually shoot their portals. Hen, meanwhile, would draw absolutely everything seen in the Flash version, animating the player character frame by frame, who the two simply named Test Subject 15837, and so too would the portals come to life by his artistic hand. Once the core functionality was down, Portal's test elements would begin to be remade. Buttons and doors would be the first. Later, cubes would be implemented with their own physics to boot. The energy pellets and turrets would be recreated, and even the spiked crushers seen in the original Portal trailer were brought into the fold. The relatively fast-paced nature of the Portal trailer sparked the imagination of Ido and Hen, as they would invent entirely new test elements as well. Electrified floors and plasma walls that came in safe and deadly variants would be brought in, making the Flash game less about solving complex puzzles and more about the player's agility in deadly environments. Over the course of the next few months, the duo would work on the Flash version day in and day out. They had no development schedule, simply working on it whenever they could. They would even skip school as much as possible to get more work done on the game. All they knew is that they had to finish it before the orange box came out. Layout designs for the levels would be drawn using MSN Messenger's built-in drawing functions. This was something that Hen and Ido considered a super weapon for their development. They used it to draw out level layouts, explain how mechanics needed to work, and show each other how to reproduce bugs. While they created a system for a following camera for levels that could be larger than a normal screen space, the designs that Hen and Ida created for levels never ended up extending beyond the screen boundaries, and this functionality went unused. The pair had a lot of anxiety in regards to the project, worried about a lot of things. Whether or not the game would be good, how long they should make it, if Valve would even approve of a project like theirs to exist. Perhaps even, would the mechanics of Portal as a sword even work if translated into 2D? Well. 
The good news was, seeing deeper mechanics emerge as they designed the levels would subside these fears. There was, in fact, worth to Portal the Flash version, as the intricacies of how the mechanics play together emerge with every level design. Han and Ido would eventually start letting their friends play the Flash version for playtesting purposes, helping them gauge feedback and assisting them in making sure the game worked. Portal interactivity would be tweaked and improved in response to the playtest their friends did, and it showed huge promise as they really enjoyed the concept. With more and more information about Portal coming out as the days went by and it was showcased at conventions and events, Ido and Han were able to solidify certain aspects of the game, and even add small new ones, like the Realization Vault right at the start of the game. As October of 2007 drew closer, the duo of We Create Stuff felt the pressure rising. They needed to get this thing done and out before Valve released the orange box. Looking back over their work, Hen and Ido had managed to produce over 40 different levels for Portal the Flash version, or tasks as they were called. There were plans for a level editor called Nail, a name parroting Valve's hammer, but this had to be thrown out as it would have required a whole rewrite of the engine. And with everything set in stone, the final polishing needed for the game being done, we create stuff would find themselves on the very final day possible, October 9th. 2007, hours before Valve would unlock the orange box. Hen and Ido would submit Portal the Flash version to the game's portal on Newgrounds. They announced the release of the game on their very own We Create Stuff forums and farewelled their creation into the depths of the internet, and they headed to bed to get a good night's rest. Finally, the duo got to create and finish a big game together for the first time. 40 tasks, roughly an hour worth of gameplay, all of Portal's mechanics, filled with a bout of easter eggs, and even a Source Engine inspired developer console, all faithfully recreated in 2D on Flash. These two teenagers had no idea what they just unleashed upon the world. Days passed, Portal itself was now out, and Ido and Han would push several updates to fix bugs and add some little bonus features to the console. But they weren't aware just how big of a success the Flash version would be the night it was put out. Portal the Flash version instantly reached the Newgrounds front page the very day of its release. It proceeded to get a daily feature and even won the weekly user's choice six days later. As these rewards piled up, the duo truly felt just how overwhelming the response was. I don't think it could be understated just how big of a splash the Flash version made on the internet. We're not talking something on the fandom level. There were tens of millions of people who would end up playing the Flash version as hundreds of Flash sites re upload it. For a lot of these players, it may have even been the first time they laid eyes on Aperture's handheld portal device. Hen and Ida were only 16 and 14 when they did this. The mere idea of having tens of millions of people playing a game that you and your friend made together in any capacity is an unfathomable thing no matter your age, let alone when you are teenagers. But it showed greatness. Everyone who played the Flash version absolutely fell in love with it. For a lot of people, it would go on to define their very childhood. Portal did cost money after all, and for those who lived in less fortunate circumstances, this Flash game was their way of experiencing Portal. For some people, they may have not even had a good enough PC or laptop to run Portal, but they would find solace in the Flash version as a worthy supplement. The days, weeks, months, and even years following the Flash version's release would be monumental in their own right. The fan game, despite the 3D original it wanted to emulate being a product for anyone to enjoy, gained a bit of a following as a result of its easy to access nature. There were thousands and thousands of videos that came onto the YouTube platform of people just recording themselves playing it. There were people doing blind playthroughs, walkthroughs, cheat codes, glitch hunts, even people who got creative with using a Flash version as a vehicle for funny videos. The thing was, that Portal the Flash version was not seen as a worse version of Portal just because the two coexisted. 
Portal itself was only two hours long in casual playthroughs. The Flash version was not seen as an inferior Portal game. It was seen as more Portal. It really made you wonder if Valve themselves ever acknowledged such a fan game. This was something that Ido and Hen did actually try to do. They emailed Valve prior to the launch of the Flash version to show them the game. But unfortunately, the duo recreate stuff was met with radio silence as Valve was at the time working their butts off on finishing the orange box. But considering the absolute reach that this Flash demake of Portal had, it's almost certain that news of it did reach Valve. A few months had passed since the release of the Flash version, and Portal itself had now fully set in. Valve had just created a fan base that was now ready for more content, more puzzles to solve, and Portal 2 wouldn't be on the horizon anytime soon. While the Flash version was a worthy supply of more Portal content, it wasn't a first person game, and there was no GLaDOS. People wanted to step back into the heel springs of Chell and square off against Aperture's Queen once more. Hen, seeing a starving fan base, got an idea in early 2008 of how he could bring them new content. He would advance the 2D fan game to the next dimension. When 2008 rolled around, Hen, independent of involvement from Ido, would begin to recreate the Flash version in Portal 1. Utilizing Hammer, which was Valve's main tool creating levels when they're still using the Source Engine, the task Hen had set himself to seemed absolutely Herculean in scope. The thing is, this wasn't Hen's first rodeo with the Source Engine. In 2005, he had actually developed a horror mod for Half-Life 2 known as Nightmare House, the precursor to the insanely popular Nightmare House 2, released in 2010. At the core of Hen's new Source project, it seems like a simple premise. Recreate the Flash version in 3D with actual Portal. But when you break it down, having to remake over 40 levels already makes the Flash version map pack a project that has more content than the original Portal did. And Hen was working alone this time. Through Hen's sheer perseverance over the next few months, these levels will be recreated piece by piece. A lot of decisions had to go into translating these levels into 3D environments. What would work in 3D? What would have to be cut? Is there anything that could be improved upon or changed for this room's layout? These questions were potent throughout the entire development process of the Flash version map pack as every level had to be translated into 3D with the right level of care to keep the spirits of the original levels intact. Yet, they also had to work in 3D without feeling like a first person camera was slapped into the original game. Hen describes it simply, because the original Flash version was a 2D game, it meant the camera would be showing a room layout from a perspective the player wouldn't realistically see. This 2D camera meant the Flash version could get away with having large chunks of level dotted about in rooms only accessible through holes, since the player would be able to see all these spots from their platformer style perspective. However, enter first person and these layouts would be a straight up maze to even try and decipher in a reasonable manner. Now arguably some of the final few levels do still struggle in this regard, but what could you do without radically changing their layouts? As the levels would need to be remade, so too would their brand new test elements. Crushers would be reimagined from the spiky selves. Now there are flat slabs instead of spike plates. Of course, still functionally identical. The plasma fields will be brought to life via the reuse of Half-Life 2's asset set. The force fields the Combine had would be reused as the look for the blue plasma field, while an array of lasers would start as a red plasma field. And the most interesting to see realized, electric fields. No longer just a simple grey bar that glows blue and active. Their remade map pack selves would see them reimagined with the electrical arcs shooting between each side of the field, combined with an excellent reuse of sounds. The companion cube, something not known about during the original Flash version development, would even end up making an appearance in one of the remade levels. Now featuring a new survival segment where you had to use the cube to shield yourself from turret gun fire on an unstationary scaffold. Alongside simply remaking the levels, Hen wanted to try adding various story elements to the experience, something not present in the Flash game. The biggest indicator of this is that GLaDOS would finally make an appearance in the Flash version as an actual voice and not just random disembodied text, 
commenting on the player's actions the whole way through. As part of a previously mentioned required test protocol, we can no longer lie to you. When the testing is over, you will be... And, hey, remember how I mentioned way earlier that Hen and Ida were diehard Half-Life fans? Well, Hen, absolutely hyped from when Episode 2 revealed about Portal, decided to go for some self-indulgent fanfiction and added a sequence involving the legendary Borealis ship back at home within the confines of Aperture Science. Then, of course, once all the levels were remade, it came time for an escape sequence. Head knew that at some point during it, he wanted the player to find something, but wasn't quite sure what it would be. The Borealis had already been used, but luckily, he managed to come up with an idea. A cloning lab. By adding a lab full of Chell clones, Hen would be able to retroactively show the player that they were just one of many Chells, and even would be able to tie into Portal by having there be multiple of the same test subject. Unbelievably, Hen actually came up with this idea independent from the GLaDOS dialogue that insinuates her having cloned Chell. As the Flash version map pack was nearing the end of its development, Hen would meet someone who became a friend of theirs. This person is known as Yoav. Yoav was knowledgeable in the audio department of things, who demonstrated to Hen a way they could make their own new GLaDOS voice lines. Hen was excited at this prospect, and would collaborate with Yoav on making a test map to see how they could work together. This map will be known as GLaDOS Voice Test, featuring entirely new GLaDOS lines made by Yoav. This next test chamber will feature a new element that you, subject name, here have never experienced before. Please allow our dear staff to suggest. Watch your step. Unfortunately though, Hen and Yoav met far too late into the project's development, meaning there was no real room to squeeze in new GLaDOS sequences. However, Hen had been working on something for the map pack that Yoav could contribute to. Inspired by the feeling of being chased through Portal's escape sequence, Hen sought to recreate that feeling in a boss fight. Hen would masterfully craft a design made out of moving pieces of world geometry, decals, and models. Around this time of development, Hen was playing Dawn of War, a Warhammer game. As a result, the design of this boss would be influenced by the Hellfire Dreadnoughts from the series, and with this, one of Portal's most iconic fame bosses will come into existence. Someone is going to get badly hurt. The Aperture Science Heavy Duty Super Attack Mecha. I'll just call it the Mecha for brevity. This boss fight would feature a player trying to escape as they would be chased by this huge bipedal foe, needing to avoid being shot by lasers. The second phase would incorporate energy pellets, letting the player actually fight back against the Mecha. Yav, who had some experience in music, was put to the task of composing a boss fight music for the Mecha. What he composed was incredibly unique, and it helped give this robot a clear and standout role as the epic finale this map pack needed. With an ending that sought to remind players of the universe they were in, Hen was able to finish the Flash version map pack, and Yoav managed to contribute something memorable to it. Unlike last time when the original Flash version was passed between friends, Hen actually had put out a call for playtesters on the We Create Stuff blog, letting people give it a try and reporting on anything that needed to be fixed. On May 3rd, 2008, Han would finally release the Flash version map pack to the world, and for the second time, We Create Stuff's work would make a huge splash in the Portal fandom. Just like with the original Flash version, Hen's incredible work put towards reimagining it in 3D as a portal map pack paid off. At the time that the map pack came out, it had been half a year since Portal came out, and the map pack was an absolute smash hit. People were amazed by the quality and quantity of the map pack, with many citing it at the time as one of the best Portal experiences they had ever played. Even people who wanted to see more Portal content made by Hen. The TFE map pack for its time was undoubtedly 
one of the most content-packed Portal 1 mods, featuring 40 test chambers, various elements of story thrown about, and an escape sequence that features one of the most memorable bosses in Portal modding. It was truly a project to behold. Of course, it's one thing to release a Flash game, but it's another thing entirely to release a project on the Source engine of this caliber. In fact, unlike its Flash-based predecessor, Hand released a trailer for the map pack a month prior to its release, which racked up a mind-boggling 126,000 views as the years have gone by. So you really can tell people had their eyes turned towards the map pack. Though, the translation of the Flash version's unique mechanics and levels was not what people remember it for. People were much more infatuated with the story elements. The Borealis' presence was a huge one in particular, with Half-Life 2 Episode 2 still fresh in everybody's minds, and Episode 3 hype being incredibly strong in 2008, a lot of people would be ecstatic seeing the Borealis actually within Aperture Science. It was something that truly helped people visualize connecting the stories of Half-Life and Portal, and I wouldn't doubt that it inspired many crossover ideas within the minds of fans as to where the two series could have gone. The Borealis' cameo, cool as it is to this day, was not the only thing that interested people with the map pack story. The cloning lab of Chells is such an incredibly memorable set piece that it's been used as one of the things that downright define the map pack in people's memories. The concept of Aperture Science cloning people like Chell was not out of the question. GLaDOS in the base game even has lines related to there being a backup of Chell within the facility. It really helped visualize just how sinister Aperture Science was seen as back in the day. And of course, the epic showdown with the mecha that blastered the wall for the map pack's finale the tree. Then the ending where the map pack teases you once more with the reminder you're in the Half-Life universe as a Combine gunship flies overhead, and you're presumably killed by it. Just these aspects, referencing the Half-Life series in more major ways, compared to the simple nods the official Portal game it did, was enough to cement the Flash version map pack in the minds of the community forever. Of course, as time went on, new Portal experiences would be made by the community. Most notably, in October of that year, 2008, the legendary Portal Prelude would release, a mod with a legacy of its own. As these more story-focused mods would release through the years, the quantity of the Flash version levels would make it seem unappealing. Of course, it was still beloved by many, but people at this time were really into figuring out the lore and backstory of Portal, so fan-made content that served that desire was inevitably going to blow up, especially considering the ongoing Portal 1 ARG. It is rather funny, and a little sad, to think that the legacy of the Flash version map pack wouldn't be the faithfully recreated 2D levels, but rather the entirely new story segments that were added. In retrospect, Hen still feels like there's some stuff he wishes he could have done for the Flash version map pack. One thing was that players tended to be insanely fast on escaping the mecha, and he wishes he could have made the robot speed up to catch up to them. Another thing was the missed opportunity of new GLaDOS dialogue with Yoav. There was a lot of potential in the Flash version map pack to make its own unique GLaDOS sequences, and it feels like a bummer that it was missed. Of course, Yoav didn't leave WeCreate stuff side for a while, as he would help them along with many projects going forward, even to this day. For the most part though, this is where Yoav's involvement in this particular story ends. You actually probably have heard of Yuav if you've had any meaningful presence on the internet this past decade. But you're more likely to recognize him by who he became later, because Yuav is actually the Living Tombstone. Yep, that's him. The Living Tombstone is the same guy who composed the music for the Flash version's mecha. Crazy how these things just happen, huh? We're now in the middle of 2008. However, this will not be where the full story of the Flash version itself would end. We have only seen the first half of everything, and that second half would be revealed as Hen and Ido received one of the most jaw-dropping news in their life. Valve had just emailed them.
Let's rewind the clock a little. While Han was hard at work on creating the Flash version map pack for Portal in early 2008, Valve 2 was working on something for Portal, specifically Portal 2. In 2008, Portal 2 was not the legendary sequel it ended up releasing as. Instead, Portal 2 in this year would be something entirely different. In the offices at Valve, the company had split up into multiple groups to develop new concepts to try and recapture the lightning in a bottle aspect of Portal's ingenious core mechanic. Seemingly, Valve had found their new bottled lightning, and Portal 2 would enter development under the code name of F-Stop. Now, I think the story of F-Stop bears no repeating for this video. You've very likely heard of it if you're even slightly interested in Portal 2's development. We're not here to discuss the contents of F-Stop. There is, though, something quite anomalous when it comes to Portal in 2008. And when it comes to trying to place it in the development timeline, it's a bizarre oddity. And this oddity would be revealed to the world at Microsoft's conference in E3 2008. Now, for our next announcement, I'd like to introduce a special guest speaker. Hello. We hope you've enjoyed your brief detention in the press event hall. The Aperture Science Enrichment Center is pleased to announce the worldwide debut of Portal, Still Alive, a 2008 exclusive for the Xbox 360. Due to previous tests being solvable, we are currently manufacturing new test chambers for only the most highly qualified test subjects. Good luck. Out of nowhere, it was announced that Valve will be releasing an exclusive version of Portal on the Xbox Live Arcade, featuring the subtitle of Still Alive. Now, this Still Alive version of Portal wouldn't have any information about it revealed at first, as things were kept quiet. But slowly, an interesting development about this Portal version would emerge. The month after E3 2008 in August, the Week Rate Stuff blog would be lit up with a new update. In this blog post, Eider proceeded to drop a bombshell. Valve had approached them to port the Flash version map pack to the Xbox 360 through Portal Still Alive. This, to me, is the most curious case of Valve's interaction with the community. While Valve had been known to support and place their modding scene on a pedestal, Portal Still Alive was a very interesting new chapter of the relations between Valve and modders. And unfortunately, this was a second point in documentary's production where I hit a brick wall. How do you even begin and figure out the motivation behind Still Alive's creation? With the whole company focusing on Portal 2 and later Left 4 Dead, the sheer existence of Portal Still Alive is inexplicable. No one on the internet had really cared to wonder this about Still Alive. Nor did Still Alive come with any new developer commentary. It was a complete void of information. All we knew as a public was that it just kind of popped into existence one day, and that answer wasn't one I was going to fold into presenting. I needed to get an answer to ensure I would get the most accurate information possible. So, I did the unthinkable. I sent an email to Portal 2's lead developer. In 2008, Valve was working on Portal 2. Portal 2, at the time, was being developed with a new mechanic in mind, and they had spent the better part of the year trying to make this mechanic work with the Portal formula of using it to solve test chambers. However, bridging this gap between the mechanic and Portal's puzzle gameplay was revealing a lot of design problems. Something that the Portal 2 team was fighting the uphill battle on, as they really loved the mechanic and were determined to keep it in. Midway through the year, it came time for everyone to drop what they were doing and help push the game out. The first Left 4 Dead game was nearing completion, and thus, resources from all over Valve would become diverted to getting the game out. That is, however, except for three people. At the same time that the push for Left 4 Dead's release started, Valve's at the time head of business approached the Portal 2 team 
and informed them that Microsoft had approached Valve about creating an exclusive version of Portal to put up on the Xbox Live Arcade. Considering this was even being told to the team meant that Valve and Microsoft had shaken on the deal and that Portal would need an exclusive version made for the digital storefront on the 360 console. These three aforementioned people posited to be part of the team for the Xbox Portal exclusive would be Josh Wire, the lead developer of Portal 2, Garrett Rickey, a designer on the first Portal game, and John Guthrie, a veteran map creator at Valve. With them needing to ship this product within the year, and the fact the team was so small, the team could not be ambitious. And with the rest of Valve now all record left for dead, these three developers would start production on Portal Still Alive. The fascinating part is that Valve typically would not do things like this in-house, as historically, these forms of exclusive console versions and expansion packs would be handed off to other companies to do, such as Gearbox's Half-Life 1 expansions, which made Still Alive's development quite anomalous for the company to be doing themselves. Even though they could have gotten away with doing a simple port of Portal, the three wouldn't have felt satisfied with that direction for Still Alive. Instead, the Still Alive team wanted to feature some community-made content within this version, and polish it up. Luckily for the Still Alive team, their recently released and impressively made TFV map pack by Hen would be the perfect fit. The Still Alive team would email Recreate Stuff, asking if they could acquire the level design for the Flash version map pack, causing Hen and Ido to be jaw drop stunned at the revelation that Val was interested in officializing what they made. The TFV duo happily agreed to the deal, and the Still Alive team would breathe a sigh of relief knowing that a huge development load had been lifted off their shoulders. It wasn't the first time Valve had officialized fanbase content into a retail product, as Half-Life 2 Deathmatch contains various maps created by modders as part of the base package. The Still Alive team would take certain test chambers from the Flash version map pack, and even create some of their own, totaling up to create 14 new levels for Still Alive. Polishing up a portion of the escape sequence would be considered, but dropped. The goal of the Still Alive team was not just to port these levels for 360 players to enjoy, but to also polish them to a higher standard. This would range from improving the art direction of textures and lighting, to making puzzles more clear and readable to players. GLaDOS's presence would be dropped from Still Alive in the translation of the TFV map pack to a retail product, which helped in cementing the project in a non-canon position in the wider world of Portal Media. As mentioned prior, the existence of Portal Still Alive will be announced once E3 of 2008 rolled around during Microsoft Showcase, and Doug Lombardi would confirm the existence of new levels in Still Alive based on the Flash version map pack included as challenge levels. In order to help aid the development process and cement the bonus status of the exclusive new Still Alive content, the maps would be separated from each other, having to access each level individually via the menu. This circumstance of plotting the levels as individual bonus maps would also allow the Still Alive team to add a replayability via the bonus challenges from the base game, allowing players to take on the least time, least portals, and least step challenges within the Still Alive levels. And eventually, on October 22nd, 2008, Portal Still Alive would be released on the Xbox Live Arcade, sitting at a price tag of around $15. Portal Still Alive would feature the entirety of Portal 1, complete with all its original bonus features like developer commentary, advanced chambers, and a challenge mode, but it would also come with 14 little levels based off the Flash version map pack. Still Alive also contains an entirely unique achievement set. Besides the full rehashed achievements of Portal 1 that were updated, there were 8 entirely new achievements that would be added to Still Alive, and these new achievements would never end up on PC version of Portal to this day. These achievements actually had fascinating challenges, such as Out of the Blue, where once a player got the fully powered portal gun, they would have to play the entire game by only exiting out of blue portals. Or even, Is Anyone There? An achievement for doing a damages run at Portal by not getting shot by a turret once. Regardless, when Still Alive released, it was reviewed really well among those who played it, People were happy to jump back into a portal game and experience some brand new challenges, though some people were puzzled at the exclusion of GLaDOS in the new levels and were hoping for more of her. The most interesting part of Still Alive's release is the fact that prior to it coming out, Doug Lombardi had stated the levels featured in Still Alive would not be brought to the PC version of Portal. 
He said that PC players, quote, already had the levels in the form of the TFE map pack, and thus there was no need for it. Only, however, this statement does not hold up so well post-release. While, yes, the core fundamentals of the puzzle we kept in check and unchanged, some puzzles saw radical changes, and some were just entirely unique. In more recent times, we even got the Portal Companion Collection for the Nintendo Switch. This is a port of both Portal games that brought them to Nintendo consoles for the first time, done by NVIDIA Lightspeed Studios. Portal's port actually seems to be directly based off of Portal Still Alive in some capacity, which is a huge surprise to see. While the exclusive achievements wouldn't actually be ported over to the Switch, all the remade Flash version levels are here to play, with the bonus challenges included. So now there's a way, alongside the Steam Deck, to actually play these levels portably. Though, you're probably just best off using a Steam Deck if you have the money to snag one, considering the cooler looking UI for Portal on there. Plus, you can probably just install both the original Flash version map pack and the fan-made ports of Still Alive's levels, which there is many to be found. Undoubtedly though, to have at least some of the work done by hand immortalized within a retail portal product in some capacity is amazing, especially with its origins dating back to the original Flash game he had made with Ido. While this is where the story with the recreate stuff do I would officially end, this is where the story with Valve's relationship with Portal the Flash version would get so, so much more interesting. It was now the end of November 2008. Valve had just finished shipping Left 4 Dead out to the world, and the Portal 2 team would be able to recuperate and begin to work on the game again. Only one small issue with that. Do you remember how I said that Valve was having a lot of trouble trying to bridge together the f-stop mechanic with Portal's puzzle formula? Well, Surely, you'd expect that Valve would come up with a solution to this problem the second they got back to Portal 2 development. Once they were fresh out of finishing Left 4 Dead, it meant there may be more resources and, importantly, more employees that could provide new perspectives on making these two work. Clearly, this would be the perfect scenario for Valve to bounce back and begin to streamline the mechanics interactivity with Portal's formula. However, a certain someone had gained a new perspective, a very radical new perspective on how to solve the problem of Portal 2 being stuck in its, quote, throw things at the wall and see what sticks state. A sentiment grew within them. Still Alive had ignited something within Josh Wire, the lead developer of Portal 2. And eventually, this would be a sentiment the team would begin to share as a whole. Creating Portal Still Alive had shown everyone that Portal 2 did not need to be a game with a radically different direction for its core mechanic. The Portals still had so much untapped potential to explore, so much more that could be done with them. A tough choice would have to be made here, as the f mechanic was having a lot of trouble fitting into the puzzle formula that the first Portal game had laid the groundwork for. This all came to a head as Gabe Newell, who needs no introduction, walked into a Portal 2 meeting at the Left 4 Dead shipped, simply dropped his head in the feet and said to the team, we are making Portal 2 without portals. This will be the final shove needed that told the Portal 2 team that they would need to restart everything. It was decided to shelve the f stop mechanic, but hold on to it for a future title, where perhaps it may fit better, and with it, they would finally place the Portal Gun right back into the hands of the player. As the year closed out and Valve went on vacation, Portal 2 would find new hope as its development was entirely rebooted. As it turned out, there was no need to radically change the core mechanic. They needed to refine and iterate on what was established in that first game for its sequel. Sometimes, the best solution to a problem really was the simplest one. There was no need to worry about how portals would work in a puzzle game after all. 
Once the year 2009 kicked in, the team would be brought together and begin to experiment with brand new testing elements for the player to encounter. Lasers that could be redirected through portals, catapults that would send you and objects flying through the air, tractor beams that would transport you through the air. But the memory of Still Alive lingered, and in came the Hard Light Bridge an evolution of the blue plasma field established all the way back in the original Flash version. Now, no longer just a barrier, but an infinitely extending surface the player can use to create walls, floors, and ceilings for puzzle solving. Even the Crushers, something only used all the way back in Portal 1's teaser trailer, iterated upon through the Flash version of its map pack, would finally get their time to shine in Portal 2 with a brand new design to boot. And, of course, the red plasma field in the form of the laser field. And that's where Portal 2's development would continue off from. The story would be iterated on as the years came by. Characters were introduced and then scrapped. Gameplay concepts are tried and then cut. Then, 2011 rolled around. And in April of that year, Valve released their best single player title yet, Portal 2. Let me explain the significance of what I just told you. When I was talking to Josh Dwyer about Portal Still Alive, he told me something that stuck with me to a degree that I was not expecting. Something that only truly hit me after I thought about it. Let me read a direct quote from Josh. <clears throat> we had been working on a different game mechanic for Portal 2 than the Portal device at the time, and we were having all sorts of difficulties trying to marry the two things together. That's because the other game mechanic didn't arise from the desire to make Portal 2. Instead, it was an independently developed idea that the company felt could potentially become Portal 2. Because of that starting point, we made decisions and changes that we wouldn't have if that mechanic had been in its own game. So, we were in the middle of a tumultuous time for the team because we were struggling to make the mechanic that we really liked and felt had amazing potential fit into a game that was really about something else. When the company shifted the focus on shipping Left 4 Dead and drained most of the ongoing game projects of staff to help in that effort, it gave us a chance to step back, work on something else for a bit, and then reassess where we were at when people had finished Left 4 Dead. Still Alive was that breather we needed to jump back into the raw portal mechanics and decide to make the hard but ultimately correct decision to abandon our previous efforts and start fresh. Without that inflection point and time to step back and consider, we may have continued down the wrong path far too long. I don't know how else I can spell this out. Still Alive very likely may have saved Portal 2 from going down a darker path. A pathway may have resulted in a game that people were not happy with shipping, or the more likely scenario knowing Valve, a game that never would have come out. If it wasn't for Valve's head of business, greenlighting the development of Portal Still Alive for the Xbox 360, we may have never gone on Portal 2. If Hen hadn't sat down to faithfully recreate the Flash version into a map pack for Portal 1, Still Alive may have never been released in a form we know it as today. If Recreate Stuff hadn't made Portal the Flash version, there wouldn't be a map pack that could even be made. If, on that day, Hen and Ido had never been hyped for Portal when they saw that initial teaser trailer? Portal 2 may not even exist. Could you imagine a world where Portal 2 never existed? A world where one of Valve's masterpieces, something that would linger through all parts of gaming culture at the time, never came out? Can you imagine a world where Half-Life 1 came into being, but Half-Life 2 never released? A world where the original Team Fortress never got its legendary sequel, Team Fortress 2? I wouldn't be here. I would not be here right now, talking to you, if it wasn't for the existence of the Flash version in Portal 2. I don't know what type of person I would be if I hadn't come across the Portal series through its sequel. I don't know where I'd be without it. I don't doubt there are tens of thousands of people who may have similarly had their life impacted by the Portal series. Whether it inspired them to pick up a creative medium or simply resonated with them, people got to show their love for this game 
through making fan projects, no matter the scale, and perhaps in its own special roundabout way. It's comforting to know that Portal 2 came out in the form it did because of the love that Han and Ido showed for Portal with the Flash version. And I think that's wonderful. Portal is one of the most influential franchises that Valve has ever made. When Valve announced Portal on July 18th, 2006 with its ever iconic teaser trailer, it inspired two teenagers to share their excitement for it through a Flash-based fan game. Portal the Flash version would then go on to land a place in the hearts of many fans it would have. Those that discovered Portal for the first time through it, and those who got to experience more of Portal because of it. With an official 3D remake of the fan game and the very engine that powered the first Portal game, its added story elements would go on to be forever remembered by those who played it. Then came a Valve sanctioned remaster of the Flash version remake in Source, and with it, a Portal expansion pack that reminded the company that they did not to reinvent the wheel to create a sequel. And with that, came one of Valve's masterpieces. All because two fans showed their excitement for the original Portal. You know, I've been holding on to a little fact for a while that I haven't been sure how to integrate into this documentary, but here goes. Within Portal 2's files, you can find a folder called Resless, which means resourceless. In this folder, it contains hundreds of files listing the resources that every single map in Portal 2 loads. Resource listing is a tool that Valve uses to essentially help them scrub unused data from the game. This means textures, models, and sounds specifically. However, something that Valve forgot to clean out before the game was released was the fact that this folder contains hundreds of listings of developmental maps, early versions of final maps, maps used for demo showcasing like Void 3, entirely scrapped maps, test maps, personal maps developers may have made, you get the drill. Well, one of these resource lists is for a level with a very special name. SP Destroyed Still Alive. By opening the .lst file in a text editor, you can read every single asset this map would have loaded. This map, Destroyed Still Alive, loads the chamber sign model for the 8th chamber in Still Alive. Now, we have no clue what this map's actual contents are, what its purpose was, if it was even intended to be part of the game, or if it was just a little fun thing a developer made. But, the context of it doesn't matter to me. I think its mere existence is a beautiful testament to the legacy of the Flash version. The fact that this turret introduction chamber, created all the way back in 2006 for a Portal fan game, would wind up in a sequel to the game it tried to remake in some form, is a poetic way for me to put a bow in the story. A story that truly shows the legacy a piece of art can have, the standing power a video game can have through the ages, to be iterated upon through the years and still resonate with people in some form, no matter how far it got from its original self. Video games are art, they've always been art, from the very beginning. No matter the scope of the game, no matter the scale of the team behind it, whether it's a single person or thousands of people, there's a story about the creation of the art piece. Stories are inseparable from art, and just as a video game may tell its own story, its very creation is a story that is worth passing down for those inspired by the game to create their own art. Writing, drawing, making your own game, there are hundreds of ways art can inspire stories, stories can inspire art, stories inspire other stories, and art inspiring other art. It's a beautiful self perpetuating cycle of humanity, to know that our purpose is to tell stories and to create art, no matter the form those two would take. And sometimes, the story doesn't need to be something overly complicated to understand. Sometimes a story is simple. The story of Hen and Ido's creation of Port of Flash version is a beautiful story of how art can inspire other art, and in the modern era, that very art that they made can inspire the creators of the original to make even more. 
This silly little Flash game would not have been made if it wasn't for the inspiration the original Portal trailer gave it to. And to try and think of the ramifications on the gaming timeline that would have come about with a Hidden Idris fan game is almost unfathomable with everything you know now. I really do believe that no matter how insignificant a story may seem, that story is worth preserving. It's worth talking about that story, keeping a record or a memory of the past so that you can tell it to those in the future. The Flash version of the story is something that not many people thought about, that most people will think is a one and done deal, that we create stuff just made the Flash version move on with life. They may have not even known that the map pack was directly made by someone behind the original Flash game. Of course, the Flash version isn't special in the regard of having a super in-depth legacy. There are dozens if not hundreds of things all created in Flash that have some super crazy history in their own right, some more impactful than others. Animations, games, you get the gist, these are all art that matters. But what makes the Flash version special is from its unique situation and the interesting way that its history would end up panning out. To think that the Flash version, something so embedded into the bedrock of the Portal fandom, has a history that almost no one knew is shocking considering its sheer spread. The tale its legacy has is absolutely unfathomable at just how deep it goes. It was a story that could have been lost to time. A story that may have not even be fully known by the very participants of it, who wouldn't know just how far the legacy of one piece of art may have gone. But now, you all know the story too and I'm honored to have been the one to present it to you, as its storyteller. I'm Austin Flau, the Portal Lore Master, and thank you. Thank you for listening to the story of how a Flash game changed Portal history.